Well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Christine Morgan, who is our Chief Scientific Officer of the Institute. I'm sure she's no stranger to probably all of you. Um, uh, Christine's responsible for establishing the research priorities uh, for advancing soil health, uh, developing not only the strategies, but the implementations of these uh, research projects. Uh, research, I should say, and adoption projects and really kind of help ensure that they have, you know, benefits, really beneficial outcomes. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Christine. Thanks, Wayne. And good morning, everyone. It's, a great, it's great to see the panelists' faces and it's great to be here today. Um, I have two housekeeping things to remind everyone of. There is a QA and a uh, button down below your Zoom and you may not have a question particularly that you want to type in, but others do, and you can promote them upward by hitting the thumbs up button. And I'll be looking at those uh, for each of the, uh, for the rest of the day, and we'll be using those Q and A's to answer, uh, choose the questions that we ask. Secondly, please remember that at the end of each session in the morning and in the afternoon, there will be a QR code available for you to snap if you want um, um, credit, credit for uh, the CCA program with the Tri Societies. Uh, with that, I just want to do a quick introduction. Uh, we, the U.S. Regenerative Cotton Fund is uh, really kind of the focus of this next uh, part of our annual meeting. And we have three fantastic panels, always uh, generally everybody's favorite at our annual meeting is when we get to hear from stakeholders, especially from farmers, uh, about how they perceive soil health and how um, their, their um, implementing soil health practices. Um, so our U.S. Regenerative Cotton Fund has a goal of increasing adoption of regenerative soil health systems in U.S. cotton through empowering farmers and their advisors with locally relevant technical knowledge, economic information, and decision support tools. I'm particularly very excited about this project because it's really our first opportunity at the Soil Health Institute to truly integrate our whole theory of change and address the community need for communities of practice for farmers and their and their advisors to talk more about soil health and share their learnings, as well as focus on the economics and the economic case for adoption of soil health. And then lastly, my favorite, the soil science part, which is our soil health targets. Um, so with that, I'll start. David Lamb is going to moderate our first panel. And Mr. David Lamb is a soil health educator at the Soil Health Institute, where he conducts soil health education programs for farmers, their advisors, and other practitioners across the United States. Building from his 40 plus years of experience working directly with farmers to improve the health of their soils and associated natural resources. David has served on various positions within the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, NRCS, rising to national team leader of the inaugural National Soil Health and Sustainability Team. And I have to say, I think David Lamb is the person that I've learned the most from since uh, in my three years at the Soil Health Institute. So very happy to turn it over to you, David. Thank you, Christine. That's a very kind uh, introduction. Now, it's, it's, anytime I hear my bio, it just tells me two things. Uh, I've been around a long time and I've had a lot of experiences. And probably the two I've been most proud of is the fact that uh, two conservation efforts that have been involved in my career, or my career has been involved with. First, back in the 80s and 90s, the advocation of no-till farming, being able to get out and work with producers, trying to get them to adopt that, you know. And of course, the whole focus there was primarily on erosion control at the time. But now we've kind of evolved into the second generation of conservation efforts with this adoption or, or awareness of soil health. And I think that's really a more holistic approach, a more regenerative approach. You know, we're looking at the soil as this living ecosystem that can be managed in a positive way and, and, and for, with the ultimate result of having more improved soil function that, that helps to sustain, you know, plants, animals, and, and even humans uh, a, as a species there, so to speak. And what we're really fortunate today is have four producers who I'm going to read a quick bio because we want to get into some questions and answers and discussions, more have a kind of a casual conversation with them. So let me read through that real quickly here. We've got uh, from, from uh, Texas uh, up there in, in the, uh, by uh, Roby, Texas, which is between Lubbock and Al 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 Albaline, uh, we've got uh, Richard uh, Gaiola, and his, him and his wife uh, phone and own and operate about 20, or uh, a farm, it's called uh, Gaiola uh, Farm Ventures. 
Nairobi, uh, consists of about 3,000 acres of dryland cotton and another couple hundred acres of irrigated. And they also raise wheat, hay, and have a livestock operation. Uh, Richard's involved with cotton uh, all over the place. He works for the, as a chair, the uh, chairman of the board of the Rolling Plains Cotton Growers there in St uh, Stanford, and, and along with some other responsibilities. Uh, secondly, we have Adam Chappell, who's from, of all places, Cotton Plant, Arkansas. I think that's kind of appropriate because Adam raises a lot of cotton down there along with some rice, uh, some corn, and some other crops on some uh, semi-MRI or semi-irrigated ground. He does some fl uh, uh, flood irrigation, that type of thing. Adam's been out there in the forefront working with the Arkansas Soil Health Alliance, doing a lot of education. You can look him up and he's done a lot of YouTubes out there, has a great message. Uh, third, we've got uh, Lamont Bridgeforth, who's from Northern Alabama, just uh, north of Birmingham, about hundred miles. He's a fifth generation farmer. And to keep on the farm that long, it means he's had to have been successful doing something and maybe he can share some of those experiences. Besides cotton, uh, he raises corn and other commodities. He also serves on the cotton board, uh, which helps to oversee those activities of the Cotton Inc. And then last, but certainly not least, is Barry Evans, who's a fourth generation farmer from Swisher County, Texas. And he, uh, he raises cotton, grain sorghum, winter wheat, is involved with No-Till Texas out there. If you've ever had opportunity to participate in that training effort, you'll, you'll see Barry out there as part of that. So these four producers represent multi-generational farming, which means they've had to be successful. They've had to adapt to changes over time. Uh, they have diverse cropping systems. They raise cotton, they raise corn, they raise uh, rice. Uh, they raise these in a diverse re region, as Wayne mentioned. Uh, Texas is a little drier than what we are in Alabama, but yet Alabama can get some dry soils too, uh, just because of the way, uh, the nature of the soils there. Uh, they're all early adopters, which I think is really important because they've been willing to stick their neck out and take some risk. And we want to find out how about that. And then the last thing, they're all community leaders and they're looked up to in the agricultural community. So I really want, if we were on an auditorium, we'd sit here and we'd applaud, applaud all four of you for, for participating, uh, but well, we can't do that since we're in this virtual medium here. So, but I wanna throw out the first question. And, and since I kind of know Adam a little bit better than the rest of you, I might throw it his way. You know, and I, I wanna get the response from all of you. What were your driving forces that made you interested in changing and adopting those activities and, and practices, uh, what we call a soil health management system? You know, what, what was your motivation there, Adam? Uh, well, my motivation was uh, keeping the farm going okay. for another generation. Uh, we were going broke farming the way we'd always farmed with conventional tillage and lots of herbicides and things like that. And we were up against the wall, had to change. It was either change or sell out. So uh, I started investigating cover crops as a, as a means to help reduce input costs, uh, particularly uh, weed control which was one of our biggest expenses in Arkansas, trying to fight pigweed. And that just snowballed into full tilt soil health. So the, the, I planted my first cover crop and I immediately saw a reduction in the need for herbicide. And I also noticed that my irrigation uh, needs were less on those fields. So that just led me deeper down the hole. I, I, and the longer I've done it, the, the more good things I've found and, and, and really have um, going all in on this regenerative egg stuff. So yours was economically driven. What about you, Lamont? What what was what brought you uh, into this realm of interest? There, we we <clears throat> well in the mid nineties. I was a teenager, so when we started trying to do no till and and cover crops in it, and I could tell that what it was doing was helping with the it reduced the weed pressure because we had a lot of weed pressure too. And it was, it was not only pigweed, it was, you know, all, all those other weeds that that, that would, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So in the beginning stages, I felt like it was something new and, you know, we were trying it, but we wanted, it was something we wanted to do is to preserve this because we had erosion. It was a, was a big problem for all the farmers in our area. Erosion was big, and so we wanted to slow down the erosion 
and protect our soul because our, our top soil is probably not even a foot deep. So it was critical for us for to protect our soil, protect our top soil, and really start protecting our environment. Okay, good. Let's let's go across the Mississippi to Texas. What about you, Richard? What was the motivating factor for you? Uh, here in the Rolling Plains, it's uh, known for the little small hills and things like that. And and because of wind and and uh, and our soils are real sandy. Uh, we I started it because of the wind and the water erosion. Uh, we 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 had we have contour terraces that help, but uh, with the uh, uh, putting out wheat or something like that for a cover crop, it, it seemed to help. And we're not having to run uh, sand fighters or scratchers or things like that when our, our crops are coming up. That was one of the main main reasons for, for us doing that. Okay, so again, it continues to be erosion. And Barry, what, what would be your view on this? David, the two main things are, are dust storms and water. Um, what really prompted it were dark storms. Our area was the heart of the Dust Bowl. Uh, the people back in the 30s didn't have a way to control erosion like we do today. Our technology is so good. And that was my first driving factor. But what I, you know, we're, we're in a very arid area. And what, what I really saw is by leaving that organic matter, leaving that residue on the ground, is we captured rainfall. And, and out here, capturing rainfall is everything for us. It's the most important thing we do is to, to capture rainfall. And those are the two driving factors for me. Okay. Okay. So what were the key conservation practices that you started to do, Barry, to help you capture that rainfall? And the others will kind of run backwards on this one to see, get your view, what the key practice was. And if there's any one practice that you did that you, if you had, could only do one, what would it be? So go ahead, Barry. The, the two things that really work for me are no-till, um, controlling weeds with, with, uh, out using a plow, you know, the plow hard soil structure and we can control weeds with herbicides instead of a plow. So using, using no-till, but not alone, you need to, to rotate. I rotate cotton with either sorghum or wheat. And the reason is, is cotton gives us a deep tap root, which helps break up our hard pans way, way better than the plow does. And then also rotate with a high residue crop, which helps build that residue on top of the soil to help our erosion and to help capture rainfall. So, so no-till in combination with, with crop rotations work for me. Okay. What about you, Richard? Have you adopted anything similar? We've, we've tried all those practices that uh, uh, Barry was talking about, but uh, around here, most of the people are doing a uh, rotation, like I said, with wheat and cotton, seems to be working, but we are uh, strip-tilling. Uh, through that uh, uh, residue to help capture the soil. But what we're not doing is, is on our dry land, we can't uh, double crop because of lack of rainfall. So in, a, in a, say a, uh, like 2022, we'll let our uh, wheat ground uh, rest till, till 23, and then we'll uh, uh, strip till that and try to capture the rainfall. Uh, we've seen that uh, if we try to double crop, we're not uh, our yields are, are uh, going down on on uh, uh, dryland cotton. On irrigated cotton, we I'm uh, also doing the strip till, but I can double crop on it because I've got the water to do that. But uh, it seems to be working. Uh, we just need a uh, little more help as far as incentives, you know, so we can uh, continue doing this. Okay. Lamont, well, you have a different story there on uh, there in northern Alabama. Well, we one of the things that we did probably in the early 2000s is we bought a strip till. My dad saw this thing in Nebraska, so so we felt like if we so first thing we did in the in the 90s we we started with no till, started to get away from the plows, and then then we realized that that what's going to help with that is the cover crops. So we tried to incorporate that too. And then in the early 2000s, we, we started with the strip till, which allows us to have the best of both worlds. So we, and, and we apply our fertilizer. With, now we use a strip till with the row crops, the cotton and corn. And, and uh, so we started in the mid nineties, we started with the crop rotation because we were mostly 
cotton. We, we were wall to wall cotton and then we started the, with the crop rotation. So all of these things help to increase the soil health. And so now we, we realize that cover crops are the, is in our area could be the most important thing because it helps to hold in the moisture. We get some rain, we get quite a bit of rain, but you know it can get dry. So we want to retain a lot of the moisture that we get. So cover crops is going to be huge coming this fall. So, uh, but yeah, strip till was was uh, that was a big thing for us. Okay, now Adam, I've been on your farm. I know you know till. I know you use cover crops. Uh, is there anything different that you're doing adding to those comp to complement those activities? Uh, yeah, we we are actively trying to cut out synthetic herbicide or uh, fertilizer. Excuse me. We we haven't used P or K in granular form since 2016. Uh, we've transitioned to compost and things like that. Uh, we're taking waste products from rice mills, cotton gins, saw saw mills, chicken houses, and composting that and using that as our fertilizer. And then we're actively working with uh, lower seeding rates on crops, you know, plant intensification. And uh, that's given us more opportunity to have a living mulch between rows. Like our cotton is 76 inches wide. It's basically a one in one out skip. Um, and then that lets us get our cover crops established earlier in the fall between the rows and uh, going into the next season. We, you know, instead of planting a late cover crop, we've got a really nice one going. Um, and then we're doing a similar thing with rice where we're, you know, the standard for planting hybrid rice around me is about 25 to 28 pounds. We're planting anywhere from four to six. Um, so some of the, some things like that that we're, we're doing and having good success with. Uh, and then as far as strip till, we don't do any strip till, but we are doing some chemical strips. Uh, pick that up off a boy in Tennessee, a real smart farmer over there. And, uh, it's a it's a really handy little tool. So instead of doing the strip till, we just do a chemical strip where we're going to plant our uh, cotton ma mainly. That's the one we always have the hardest time getting through the residue. But uh, those are some things we've added to the no-till and cover crops. Uh, so you're allowing your cover crops to grow between these wide rows. Aren't you concerned with competition for water, nutrients, that type of thing? By the time we establish those uh, cover crops, the uh, cotton is in the later stages of bowl fill, things uh, like that. So we're not we're not providing competition early season. Okay, okay. I, I'm curious. We well, always hear that uh, soil health takes a long time to establish. I'm just curious, Barry. When did you start noticing a change in your soil? Did it take ten years? Did you see something after the first year, or was it somewhere in between? Well, I started no-tilling in 96, and I saw, I saw effects immediately. Um, but whenever you really see the mycorrhizae and all in the soil, you know, when you dig in that dirt and you get that, that smell and you see those white streaks that are the mycorrhizae fungi and a lot of other stuff that I don't really know what is, um, you know, two or three years, you start to see that. And now, you know, the water infiltration rate has just increased greatly. We just, we can, we can infiltrate water that falls and, uh, you know, three or four or five years, we see a, we see a huge improvement. So it doesn't take as long. What about you, Richard? I, think, yeah, I know it's a little dry out there. Do things tend to slow down because of that? Yeah, that's, that's our biggest problem is not getting rainfall to get our cover crops up. So it takes us, you know, it took us probably three to five years to, to see the difference. But uh, it's, uh, I've been doing this for, I guess, since 2000. And, and uh, you can tell the difference on the farms that we're doing this on. Uh, our biggest challenge is, is uh, rainfall because uh, this past year I was planning on doing more acres and because of rainfall, I, I just could, I, you know, couldn't, uh, couldn't invest in the seed to, to put more cover crops on. But uh, that's our biggest challenge. When you say rainfall, how many inches are you talking there, we're, Richard? We're, think we're, we're looking at about uh, 15 to 20 inches of rain and this doesn't fall at the right time of year. Okay. okay. That's, that's, that's our biggest problem. So Lamont, you got any comments that would support that or? Well, we, I think um, I started paying attention in, in, uh, in 2000 and, and I, we were already doing some no-till practices and cover crops in places. And, and I just noticed there was a lot more 
moisture. There's a lot of uh, earthworms. So I'm not sure how it how long it takes, but I would think it takes maybe you know two to three years. Because I think ha uh, um, when we first started adopting these practices, I was in, like I said, I was getting out of high school, going into college. But during the breaks, I would come home to the farm and do some work in the summertime and on like Christmas breaks, those kind of things. But I, I really started paying attention because it was, a, you know, we would go to some of these seminars and that was the thing that they were pushing. And so as a cotton scout, I was, I started out at, you know, 15, 16 years old scouting cotton and, and I started paying attention in 2000. So I would say my guess would be probably two, three years. So not, not quite as long as we thought. Adam, do you, do you have similar experiences or is anything different than that? Or? Well, like I said earlier, we, we saw a reduction in herbicide use and, and even a reduction in irrigation need our first year. Uh, but we really started noticing changes in our soil after two to three years. Earthworms and things started showing up. Soil started changing color after about four years. Uh, so, you know, as far as economic benefits, we noticed those in year one as from herbicide and uh, irrigation. Uh, but as far as soil structure change, yeah, three, four years, it's really, and it's really changed a lot since then. Yeah, I think that's really important because, again, we're not talking about geological soil formation. We're talking about rejuvenating that top six, eight, ten inches. I'm just curious, what what do you all use to decide, make a decision that that you're going to use less fertilizer or less water or those types of things? What, what indicators in the soil do you look at to be able to, because that's a pretty big management change right there. And I'll, I'll just kick it off with you, Adam, because you, you, you were the one that kind of brought that up a little bit. Well, we we uh, kind of happened on the start of that on accident. We you know we would soil sample every year, grid sample, and uh, we'd always they would always call for fertilizer. It didn't matter how much we had; they'd always call for some. Well, I just started not putting some out, trying to save money, and then when I'd resample in the fall where I put it out and where I didn't would be the same, essentially, you know, within a few units of each other when I'd grid sample. So I just started not doing it. And then I met a group out of Australia that we started sap sampling and, and watching the levels in the plants. And we've yet to see deficiencies in sap samples. And early on, we were backing that up by the traditional tissue sample, because that's what we were used to, just to make sure, you know, well, because we were scared, I mean, you know, but we, we haven't seen reductions in those P and K levels. You know, the only synthetic nutrient we're still using is nitrogen. Um, and, and it was just a progression over time of, of me getting tired of putting out fertilize and having to do it every year, no matter what my sample said. So, uh, so far it hadn't burned us. Like I said, we put our last granular P and K out in 16 and our levels in our soil are as high or higher now as they were when we were sampling then. And our plants are always sufficient in both of those nutrients. So uh, that's kind of how that evolved. So that's that's an on-farm demonstration or trial. Now, Lamont, I saw you kind of smiling that one of the comments there that Adam said about the recommendations. What, what's been your guiding principles to accept change like that? We, we, we started doing the grid samples too. And, and so what, what we tried to do first was the, oh man, it slipped my mind, but it's that uh, variable rate fertilizer. Okay, yeah. So we will put in a prescription and do that. And to try to make it even, cause we got a lot of, I mean, it's, I wouldn't call it flat land, but we got a lot of hills and, and, and bottoms. And, and so we just try to make it, try to make it all even, make the plants even across the whole field. So, but yeah, that was our thing. And I, it's hard to say, I, I wouldn't say that we, we found something in the soil, but it, we were just doing the grid samples to kind of give us an idea of what's going in the tissue samples. So complimenting that. Barry, have you had similar experiences there in, in Northern Texas or? Well, oh, it's, it's really interesting. You know, I, I mentioned I controlled my weeds with herbicides. 
And what people initially think is, oh, you must use a lot of herbicide. And what's interesting is by using a crop rotation is I can use different herbicides in a grain crop than I use in my cotton crop. And that actually cuts back on weed resistance. So I actually use less herbicides. And also by not tilling the ground, by leaving knowing you, when you do have weeds and you have weed seed, you have mice and birds and all eat those weed seed and help get rid of them. Whenever you plow them under, you're basically planting them. So, so by doing this, I control weeds with herbicides, but I actually use less herbicides. And also with the fertility, when you compare my operations to say one that does continuous cotton, it takes a lot less fertilizer because you're getting the breakdown of the organic matter out of a, out of a grain crop. And, and you're putting those nutrients out of those stalks. You know, there's a lot of nutrients in a, in a grain sorghum stalk or a wheat stalk. And you're putting those nutrients back in the soil and they don't go back in the first year. You know, it kind of take, it takes a few years to kind of get where, where the soil is somewhat balanced and you're, you're recycling those nutrients through the soil where your next crop can use them. But overall, then we can reduce our fertilizer use and reduce our herbicide use, even though herbicides or, or how we do control our weeds. Okay. And Richard, do you, what do you use uh, as a measure of success to continue down this road? Well, we did the same thing. I mean, as, as Barry's doing, uh, as far as the, you know, keeping the weeds out, uh, using different uh, herbicides with wheat. But on the fertilizer side, we noticed that uh, we didn't need as much. So we have cut our fertilizer rates down on this where we're doing the uh, rotation. Uh, but we uh, we inject it right into the row, the cotton row, and uh, that's that saves us a lot of money too. But we were doing so uh, soil samples and, and things like that. But we noticed it uh, by accidentally not putting down fertilizer on some of the rotated and and noticing that we didn't need as much fertilizer. So that's what we've done now. So we've cut cut back considerably. So I'm hearing a common theme. Weed control, erosion control, whether wind or water, water infiltration, and then a more robust nutrient cycling is something that you all are, are finding is pretty pretty common uh, evidence of soil health uh, improvements and success. We, we just got a couple of minutes left, gentlemen, I, and I really like to get, we got a bunch of scientists and educators and those kind of people out there listening in. What, what do you need from them? You know, if you were to, Tell them, Adam, I need research to support this. What would you tell them right now? Put you on the spot there, buddy. Yeah, well, I'm actively talking to the ones in my state about, you know, the contribution of the life in the soil to the, to the crop. Uh, you know, there's not much practical research, at least not that I've been able to find about, you know, what a healthy soil can provide for a crop in a field. And it's obviously providing everything mine needs because I'm not applying any extra. So, you know, what point can we start weaning off of these fertilizers and, and how much do those fertilizers affect life in the soil? I mean, there's, there's so many questions I have. We don't have time to go through all of them, but those are some of the most uh, basic ones I have. And, you know, it's, 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 Biggest thing I see is, is they try to break it into individual pieces and it's a system. And I know that's harder to look at, but when we break it into individual pieces, we get some skewed results. Uh, uh, just for an example, I, I had a researcher tell me one time he was looking at a field that I had. I had purple top turnips in this field and had like a half a pound of the acre. And he uh, asked me what I was going to plant. I said, I'm going to plant cotton. He said, well, that's going to hurt your yield. I said, well, why do you say that? He said, well, I had a trial that had eight pounds of turnips and nothing else, and it devastated the cotton yield. And in my mind, that's not even close to the same thing, but in this researcher's mind, it was. So I think there's a disconnect on how, how they're looking at these systems to start with, and we need to start asking some different questions. But uh, any, any researchers want to call me, I've, I've got a... I've got a brain full of stuff. <laughs> like the there you go. Hey, thanks a lot. Of, what about you, Lamont? What would you What would you appreciate being looked into? I think in our area, uh, I mean, I, I like the idea of, of cover crops and I'm focusing on it for this fall. And I wish there would be some more research in, in our county per se, 
Now I've been to some seminars and there's been some guys uh, that are real serious about it, kind of all around this Missouri, Arkansas, Tennessee, but I really wanted want some research done in, in our area. <clears throat> and we have our extension surface has been pretty good and they try a lot of things, but to really put that, put it on some paper so so the guys in our area can see it. And I think that's that's gonna be huge for us. There's a lot of guys that kind of, they're not really consistent with it and not really thinking about the soil health. But I think that if there was some numbers in our county that would say, hey, this if you do this, these are gonna be your results. I think that would be key. Okay, well, thank you. They're, they're in Texas, Barry. What, what would you like Texas A&M to help you out with there? We really are fortunate in our Texas AgriLife research. Um, we have a good soil scientist in, in Lubbock and at Texas Tech and also at West Texas A&M are doing some, some long-term research, um, some long-term plots on, on looking at some different things. Um, you know, as dry as we are, uh, cotton genetics are a huge thing, um, uh, making more drought tolerant crops. Um, and especially as the world's population grows, you know, having having drought tolerance is huge, and that comes through breeding. And we need a lot more more emphasis on breeding, um, and and perhaps getting some of those genes from more drought tolerant crops into the crops that that would grow into cotton or sorghum or wheat. And and Mike, I say that is as being a huge step forward and something we can we can use. One other thing to to point out, you know, whenever we talk about cover crops. It's, it's so easy to say, oh, cover crops are good and they can be good, but we've also seen some detriment, you know, and Richard talked about that a little bit, you know, where we don't get rainfall, if you're trying to, to cram a cover crop in there, it can actually be detrimental to your next crop. And, and, and so, you, so there's a management to cover crops. You can't, don't just plant them. You know, we have to manage them, what we're doing, when they're planted and, and really watch that. They, just to say to do it's a good, it's not good. You really have to look at how they're managed. Yeah, that's a great, great point there, Barry. And Richard, I'm going to let you have the last word here before we turn this back over to uh, to Wayne and everybody else. Go ahead, Richard. Like uh, Barry said, we've got uh, good research here, Texas A&M and Texas Tech working together to, to uh, help us out. And But uh, like I said earlier, you know, our rainfall is the is the key there and we don't get enough and uh, to get cover crops up sometimes it's, it's difficult to get them to the size that you want to uh, you know to do some good uh, but uh, they, that's uh, that's one of those things but like I said we've learned I've learned through trial and error I mean uh, that's one good thing and and uh, but I see what works in our area and what's not working and and if we can just educate this uh, young these young guys that haven't been farming very long they think uh, you know that it'll always work you can just plant anything and and it'll work it doesn't work that way in our area so we just need more research on there so these guys can uh want to come back to farming well i appreciate those comments great great discussion we could go on for another hour unfortunately our time's up again if we could uh, offer you applause uh, i'm sure we'd get a standing ovation for the comments and and insights that you all provided